to some normalcy. And at the same time, there's also un un understandable about the trepidations about what that means. The pandemic has taken a toll on all of us, both personally and professionally. And in all cases, you have adjusted the best way you could. Like many of you, I'm optimistic and hopeful about not only this semester, but what lies in the future. Many of you are here in person today, and some of you are streaming live from your computer. An important reminder that our students, too, will come to us from different places and in different ways. It would have to be almost impossible to believe three years ago all the ways that you work to serve the students have changed so dramatically. You are teaching classes and delivering services in person and online in ways you thought were impossible just a short time ago. It is incredible to the testament of you and how you've adapted so creatively and quickly to evolving needs of our students. And of course, the students you serve has also had to make many of these adjustments. By all of your efforts, your students keep moving forward and achieving their dreams and goals. So from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of all the trustees, I'd like to thank you all for everything you've done to remove these barriers to our students' success. The trustees know that it has not been easy and in some cases very frustrating, but our students need you now more than ever and our unwavering commitment to the future and doing everything in our power to help them be successful. And I'd like to, um, we've said goodbye to Whitney so many times this last um, six weeks. Um, I'm, I'm surprised he's still hanging around, but he gets to, <clears throat> he gets to go to um, the land of, uh, of, of Disneyland, uh, the fruits and nuts. He'll be able to enjoy Pacific breezes every day off the ocean, that nice cool weather that he won't have to worry about. He'll have to put up with insane traffic. I grew up in Southern California, so I know what it's like. And in two months, he'll get the blessings of the Santa Ana winds. So it will change dramatically for Whitney. But Whitney, thank you very much, and we'll, and we'll miss you terribly. <laughs> And also, I, I'm excited for the return of Rachel Rosenthal, because uh, she was the first president that I worked with. Um, I would like to say she hired me, but um, uh, other people had some dealings with that. But I'm excited for her return. And, and Rachel, could you come out here for one minute? I have something for you. Not in the script. Matter of fact. Welcome. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think we're fortunate to have Rachel back for a short time. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our Chancellor, Brian King. Brian? I was just telling John, we hope he has a lot of years left and a lot to give. We really appreciate John and Pam and all the members of our Board of Trustees. Wow, it's so exciting to see real life people and not just boxes on a screen, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful to be back together? It's also wonderful that we have great technology. So some of you are watching live from someplace else, whether it's for health and safety concerns or based on your schedule. We're glad those who are watching the live stream are with us. And uh, probably in coming days and weeks, some who were not able to block off this time will be able to go back and watch convocation on the recorded process. So if you're watching days or hours later, welcome to you as well. It is so exciting to be back in person and you're gonna be sitting for a while. Would everybody stand up for just a second? Just stand up, look around and see who's here. And let's just take a deep breath. Just kind of breathe in and out and enjoy being around other people. And as we make this transition uh, back to spending more time together, thanks for being here today. Whether you're here in person or streaming, if you're here in person, you can go ahead and sit down. If you stood up while you're streaming, you can go ahead and sit down as well. So hard for me to believe I've been chancellor for 10 fall convocations now, and I've attended nine. And I'm gonna share a little bit about where I was 
last fall where I missed convocation. It was an excused absence, and I'm going to share why I was not able to participate. And I'm going to share what was going on with me, not because it's unusual, but, it, but because it's representative of traumas that all of you have endured in one way or another during the years of the pandemic. A lot of times the focus is on budgets and strategic initiatives, and we'll talk about some of those things and questions we want to answer together. But the focus is also going to be on recognizing and acknowledging the traumas that we have faced and in many instances shared together. After we face a trauma, we all have a choice. How will we move forward after we've encountered a major trauma? Will we choose resentment that leads to despair or will we choose gratitude that leads to hope? It's hard to believe it's been a year, but today's a bit of an anniversary for me. Almost a year ago to the day, I was not able to participate in convocation because I was spending the first of five days in the hospital just a couple miles from here. I had an unlikely breakthrough case of COVID and contracted COVID pneumonia, which as many of you know, wasn't treated with antibiotics, so none of the treatments were working and I really couldn't breathe. And my wonderful daughter is here. Celia, will you raise your hand? Celia actually drove me to the emergency room and then she and her brother had to spend the day. At that time, no one could come into the hospital except people who were being admitted or the people working in the hospital. So she and her brother had to spend several hours trying to figure out what was going on. And when your oxygen level is low enough to go to the emergency room, you're not in good shape and having trouble breathing. So that deep breath we took all together a few minutes ago, I don't take for granted the ability to do that now. So I'll never forget the moment after being in the, the waiting room with, uh, filled with, uh, with seriously ill people of all ages, including uh, children as well. After five hours, a nurse came and said, can you walk to the treatment room, which was just a short distance away and I started to stand up thinking, well, I think I can do that. And that, that's when I realized I couldn't make the short walk from the, 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 or the waiting room to the treatment room. So uh, my oxygen levels had dropped to, to such a dangerously low level. I was gravely ill. I think something I've really only come to accept in the last few months, that it was the type of illness that unfortunately many people were not leaving the hospital after they went in in the condition that I was in. So I spent the next several days in the hospital fighting for life, a lonely time. As I said, no one was allowed in the hospital except the amazing women and men who took care of me and kept me alive. And it's hard for me not to have an emotion when I think about the brave people in the hospital who were taking care at great risk to themselves of people who were seriously ill like I was. Now, as I said before, I am sharing the trauma I lived through last August not because it is exceptional, but because it is representative of the trauma that every single one of you have endured in one form or another during the pandemic. Different kinds of trauma. Your trauma may have been that someone close to you was gravely ill. You may have gone through what my son and daughter went through, wondering if your loved one was going to live or die or ever leave the hospital. For some of you, the trauma may have been the fear and uncertainty the pandemic has caused, the total disruption of the life you had known pre-pandemic, and you hear people talking about a return to normalcy. We don't know exactly what that means after three years of the pandemic, and the future will be different than the world that ended back in the spring of 2020. For you, the trauma may have been loneliness. You may have not been around any other people, or the trauma may have been that you went weeks and months without a single moment to yourself, surrounded by people, unable, unable to find any time for yourself. The trip of a lifetime may have been canceled or a wedding or important life event that you were looking forward to was postponed or canceled. You may have never wanted to teach a class online ever and suddenly you were teaching all of your classes through a computer screen. For you, trauma might be related to what is happening in the communities or the world around us and the experiences of communities, communities of color, the LGBTQ plus community, and others who are still sadly fighting an uphill battle every day for respect, safety, and equality. And I recognize the trauma and discomfort you endured during the pandic, pandemic by no means is a thing of the past entirely. We are continuing to do our best to return to face-to-face -face interactions with the safety and welfare 
of our students and employees in mind. And we know that very few decisions have been easy during the pandemic, and many difficult decisions will remain in the months and years ahead. The traumas of the pandemic, for the most part, have not by any means been a matter of choice. External events have caused us to endure trauma, and we didn't have any choice about that. But after experiencing trauma, each and every one of us does have a choice in how we will respond to the, tra the trauma that we have endured, and in many cases are still enduring. That choice is whether we will respond with gratitude and hope, or give in to resentment and despair. That choice may seem obvious, but I have to share from my personal experience, choosing gratitude and hope has not been easy. I have to admit, I've had a pity party at times and wondered why I had to endure a life-threatening illness when I thought I had made good choices and done the right thing. Didn't seem entirely fair. And fighting for breath is a really hard place to be. Even now, a year after leaving the hospital, I still wonder at times to what extent the scarring of my lungs from pneumonia will ever fully recover. So I'm not immune from the tendency to choose resentment and despair, or at least think about that option. But when I do the hard work of honestly confronting what I am going to do with the life that at one point not long ago I thought might be near its end, I recognize, I recognize that choosing hope and gratitude is the right choice. First of all, I believe, and I think all of you would agree in your lives too, I and we have much to be grateful for and much to be hopeful about. Secondly, there is way too much evidence in the world around us that resentment and despair lead to divisiveness and bitterness. And that's not the way any of us want to live, however many months of life we have left ahead of us. So let me start with gratitude and be thinking what you have to be grateful for as I share the many things that I'm grateful for, more than I can list. First of all, words simply cannot express my gratitude for the people who took care of me during the time I was in the hospital last August. They were risking their lives and do risk their lives to take care of seriously ill people throughout the pandemic. And thanks to everyone who reached out to express well wishes to me and to make sure I was doing okay and still ask, you know, months later, how you feeling, how are you doing? I know many of you are doing that with the people around you and offering encouragement and hope on a personal level. As chancellor, I'm grateful for how our faculty and staff have rolled up your sleeves during these difficult times to serve students. I'm amazed at all you have done often in a remarkably short period of time, frequently under circumstances that seem to change, if not hourly, daily, or by the week. And that's continuing to happen, that the, the circumstances we're rep responding to can change very quickly. I'm also very hopeful for the future of Folsom Lake College and the Los Rios Community College District. During the pandemic, since we, remote, since we pivoted to remote classes and services back on Friday the 13th, in March of 2020, we have faced a cascading series of crises. Without exception, we have worked together and done our best to make good decisions. Our faculty and staff have so many incredible accomplishments. We were able to convert almost all of our instruction to remote instruction in a matter of days. We found a way to provide remote counseling and academic advising in record time. We learned how to use technologies like Zoom together in new and different ways. And together, we have responded to the challenges of equity and social justice after the tragic murder of George Floyd. So much great work has happened. It can be easy to forget how far we have come together. And I want to be clear, I know that none of this happened accidentally or automatically. It is the result of your hard work, creativity, and in so many cases, a leap of faith and a trust in one another. As we move towards more in-person interactions in the coming year, I am hopeful we will continue to resist the strong pull of resentment and despair as together we answer the question, what's next? Have you thought about that? What is next for FLC and for Los Rios? 
Now, some leaders feel the obligation to answer that question and try to gaze into a crystal ball and act like they know the future. But uh, as has been the case throughout the time I've been chancellor, I do my best to tell the truth and the truth to the uh, answer, of the, the truth to the question, what's next is, I don't know. I don't think any of us really know. What we do know is some of the questions we need to ask together to prepare for a future that serves our students well. So I'm going to share with you three questions we need to answer together as we plan for the future of Folsom Lake College. Let's start with our students. Question number one, what do our students need us to become that is different from what we were before the pandemic? So the first question, what does FLC need to become? The pandemic has accelerated a long-term trend of declining enrollment. So the second question about our students is where did our students go during the pandemic? Who did we lose? And how will we get those students back to FLC? The third question, thinking about the pandemic impacting the way we work and the impact on us moving forward is what will work look like this year and in years to come? So what do we need to become? Where have our students gone? How do we bring them back? And what will work look like? as we address a, a rapidly shifting environment. So from a student standpoint, a lot has changed in the last three years. If you think back to January 1st of 2020, 80 to 90 percent of our classes were on ground and in person. So a relatively small percent of our inventory of courses was offered remotely. A student who needed to see a counselor was expected to make an appointment and come to our college campus. Most of our services, including but not limited to financial aid and admissions and records, were provided overwhelmingly on the ground. And everything changed on Friday, March 13, 2020, when we quickly and necessarily pivoted to remote instruction and services. In the coming months, we'll have an opportunity to evaluate the drastic changes for students that were necessitated by the pandemic. If we're honest, and we should be, Many of these changes were long overdue. A student who is working or caring for a child or an aging parent just doesn't have the time to get on a light rail, catch a bus, walk, ride a bike, or walk to come to receive services. One thing we know for sure is that time, time is the enemy of our students. There are a few things we can do to support our important equity goals that will have more impact in reducing the time required for students to receive services. It's not a, a binary choice. It's not just providing services online or just providing in-person services. It's making sure that we ask our students what their needs are, listen intently, and meet our students where they are. It's not either or, it's both and. Students of color and first-generation students simply have less time to seek the services they need to enroll and secure financial aid, among other difficult steps on the way to the classroom. Many of you have been involved in our important work to redesign financial aid and admissions and records, and we will continue to do everything we can to reduce barriers for our students in accessing vitally important student services. Now, with respect to students, and uh, who want to access classes, the pandemic has had a dramatic impact on the modality of instruction. Before the pandemic, as I shared, only 10 to 20 percent of courses were online, and it seems like ancient history now, but back before the pandemic, the discussions we were having about responding to the student demand for online courses were often spirited and at times contentious. The sudden unexpected necessity to pivot to remote instruction on March 13th, 2020 changed everything. As we begin the fall semester, student demand for remote instruction continues to be at an all time high. Generally online classes are still filling first before on ground classes. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, any of us who think we can predict the future have been humbled greatly in the recent years, but it does seem unlikely that the demand for online education will decline dramatically, particularly in the short term. Some students may choose to learn online based on legitimate appropriate health concerns. And for those students who are working or caring for family members, 
remote instruction may be the only way that they have access to higher education at all. We have offered online classes in many disciplines for the first time during the pandemic. Now we have a wealth of data to review and analyze and improve online instruction when we see how our students are doing in an online environment. Together we are committed to making sure we meet the needs of all of our students in the classroom, whether that is a traditional classroom here on campus in Folsom or one of our centers, or an online synchronous or asynchronous classroom. We also face the difficult question of how to balance what students want with what is best for their success. In this new environment, we must make sure that we meet our students' needs in both on-ground and online classes and in providing services. We need to find space to have these vitally important conversations and recognize that while we are exploring the options, our students will be voting with their feet and with their fingers when they are clicking whether they want to attend in on-ground classes or online classes. Our focus is, always has been, and always should be on providing outstanding teaching and learning. So the second question has to do with our drop in enrollment. And I know you're well aware the pandemic has rapidly accelerated a decline in enrollment at Folsom Lake College, at all of the Los Rios colleges, at every community college in the state of California, and most community colleges across the United States. The amount of students who have not enrolled here at FLC or one of the other three Los Rios colleges is staggering. You may be surprised to know that our over -enrollment, overall enrollment is down more than 20%. One in five students are not attending at the levels that took place before the pandemic. And unfortunately, the decline has not yet stopped. Today, our enrollment for the fall semester that begins tomorrow and uh, with many more classes on Monday is down about 5 to 10 percent from last fall. So enrollment is continuing to decline as we begin this semester. One reason the massive nature of the enrollment decline may be a bit of a surprise to some is that for the first time in the history of California Community Colleges, this rapid decline in enrollment has not impacted funding. In fact, because of the confluence of several unprecedented factors, state funding for our colleges is at an all-time high at the same time we have experienced the most rapid decline in enrollment in Los Rios and California Community College history. We should enjoy this moment, and it is a moment, and our ability to prudently provide large retro payments and ongoing salary increases and we should acknowledge we have great leadership from our elected leaders, including Trustees Knight and Pamela Haynes and the Board of Trustees. Let's give them a round of applause for their wise fiscal leadership. We have to recognize this moment is very unlikely to be sustainable. Sooner rather than later, declining enrollment will negatively impact our state funding. And I want to be quick to say the primary reason we focus on enrollment and access is not because of the inevitable negative impact on funding, but because we know that expanding access at our colleges provides the pathway to a better life for tens of thousands of students we serve every semester. So let's talk a bit about where our students have gone, more guesswork on that, who we have lost, we have a lot of good data on that, and how we will work together to increase access in the future. Many experts have offered explanations for the dramatic enrollment decline at community colleges. You may have some theories from your vantage point. Some point to the proliferation of low-skilled jobs with high wages. A potential student can earn $18 at in and out on the way to Highway 50 without any training or experience. Unlike the Great Recession in 2008, the state and federal governments provided billions of dollars to support displaced workers, so potential students did not have the same incentives to seek out higher education that they did during the Great Recession. Another alternative for our students is in some ways the invisible growth of competitors who have grown dramatically during the pandemic while our colleges have lost students. If you look at enrollment numbers for online providers, including Southern New Hampshire University, Uni University of Phoenix, Western Governors University, and Arizona State, 
In many instances, in instances, their enrollment has exploded because of the convenient offerings that they have and their, uh, their experience in providing online education. So the competitors are there in our marketplace for sure. There are other possible explanations for the enrollment decline, and we'll continue to look at the demographics of our region and other reasons why enrollment has dropped surprisingly and precipitously during the pandemic. So we don't know all the answers about where our students are gone. We have a good deal of data about who the students are who have not enrolled during this period of rapidly declining enrollment. As you might expect, the most negative impact has been, as it always seems to be, on first generation students, students of color, and economically disadvantaged students, the students who are at the heart of our mission at FLC in Los Rios. Each of our colleges will continue gathering data about the demographics of the enrollment decline during this fall and beyond. So what will we do to restore the access loss during the pan pandemic? Our shared focus will be on equity informed strategic enrollment management, and this will require a total team effort. How many of you believe that you have a role to play in restoring the lost access at Folsom Lake College? How many of you see a path to be a part of the solution. I'm glad to see all the hands are raised because that is true. Every single one of us needs to ask what we can do to contribute to restoring access. Enrollment losses or gains are not the sole responsibility of just the instructional officers or administrative leaders or our wonderful outreach or marketing teams or any single part of our organization. Every part of a student's experience at our colleges has an impact on enrollment and we need a holistic mentality to address the enrollment decline. In addition to bringing new students in, we are looking at the data and learning that their retention rates have dropped at a greater rate than the uh, rate of new students enrolling. So if we're going to address our enrollment decline, increasing our retention rates will be incredibly important as well. So I encourage you to actively participate in efforts to recapture lost students as well as our efforts to increase our retention rates for students who have already enrolled. So the first two questions have focused appropriately on our students. The final question asks, how will these seismic changes underway impact all of us who work at Folsom Lake College and in the Los Rios Community College District? What will work look like this year and in years to come? Just as remote services for students were uncommon before the pandemic, so was remote work for our faculty and staff. The expectation for all of us, unchanged for decades, was that doing your job involved getting into a car, getting on a train or bus, walking, riding your bike, and coming to work. Once at work, you did your job, in many cases, much in the same way as you might have done your job in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. But the pandemic dramatically changed or expanded our ideas of what it means to work and where we can do our work. I don't know about you, but it feels like my job has changed in some ways more in the last three years than in the rest of my career combined. Now my title and job description haven't changed, but the expectations have changed dramatically. In a lot of ways, I can do my work anywhere where I have an inter internet connection and a phone and a computer. This new world of work anywhere, anytime has disadvantages and advantages, just like everything else in life. The good news, our work can now be much less bind by, bound by where we are and what time it is. What's the bad news? Our work is much less bound by where we are and what time it is. So the workday can expand even more when not bound by place and time. And for many, the workday seems to never end and the idea of a weekend is more of an illusory construct than ever before. At times, the opportunity to work remotely can create wonderful opportunities. Almost no one misses a long commute, and greater flexibility can be a real plus in, work, in, in supporting family and loved ones. On the other hand, all of us at times have missed the interaction like we're having those of us in the room today with other people in three dimensions and we may see a loss of collaboration and, at times, a loss of collegiality and civility. 
How many of you have participated in a Zoom meeting in the last couple of years where at some point someone said something a little pointed or a little harsh and you wondered if they might have behaved a little differently if they were physically in the same room with the person they criticized or questioned? We have to be really careful that the distance that technology can bring does not cause us to lose a sense of treating each other well. The opportunity for remote work has impacted a large majority of our employees, but I do want to note re remote work was not a possibility for everyone during the pandemic. Our Los Rios Police Department, custodians and ground workers, many other employees, I don't want to leave anyone out, who worked on ground throughout the pandemic to keep our colleges operating. Let's pause and give a round of applause to the people who kept our colleges running smoothly during the pandemic. And I know many more of our folks are back on ground this fall to respond to and address student needs. So moving forward, the key we want to maintain and build upon is trust. We have trusted employees and each other to get the job done, whether the work is happening in person or remotely. That trust will continue to be a cornerstone in the future as we contemplate what work is best completed remotely, what can be completed remotely or in person, and what requires a physical presence on campus. In every instance, the driver will be determining how can we best serve our students. So as we prepare for the start of the fall semester, nobody knows what the next challenge will be in the coming weeks and months. No one knows what the future holds in store for us. By now, we all know we should expect the unexpected and some event will happen that will cause us to pause and recalibrate and be nimble and flexible and responsive. I look forward to digging into some of the tough questions as we get ready for what's next, including the three questions we've briefly explored today. What do we need to become after the pandemic to meet our students' needs? Where are our students gone? Who have we lost and how do we get them back? And thirdly, what will work look like for our faculty and staff in the future? The exploration of these three questions together and others in many ways will be the most important work we do together this year. As the saying goes, often it's not about the journey. It's about, it's a, it is about the journey and not about the destination. Sometimes it's about the destination too. But as we explore really tough questions, taking the trip together is going to be really important in finding ways to have the conversation. And I encourage you to share thoughts or insights you may have directly with me via email or stop me if you see me around campus or, uh, or schedule a time to meet. I'd be happy to have a cup of coffee or if you want to email, my email, as you, as you may recall, is not Queen B, it's King B at losrios.edu. So I encourage you to share thoughts and insights you may have that have been prompted by our time together today. Now I know the work to unpack these questions will continue to come from a place of not just gratitude and hope, but also kindness towards and caring for one another. The trauma we have all endured over the past years has left us vulnerable, and acknowledging and appreciating that vulnerability can be the key to coming together to do what is best for our students. We don't always know what our colleagues or students are going through. That's why we need open hearts and open minds as we do this work together. I have no doubt that we will answer these questions coming from a place of gratitude and hope. And one final thought about how we can survive another challenging year together is that if we focus on gratitude and hope, the result will be kindness towards each other. Kindness doesn't mean we'll always agree or that we shouldn't be forceful in making the case for our beliefs. Kindness simply means interacting in a way that recognizes the humanity of the other person and recognizing that everyone has endured trauma, whether we know what that personal trauma is or not. So in conclusion, I want to thank you for your kindness today in allowing me to spend part of early Friday afternoon with you. And I am excited and look forward to our work together in charting a future for Folsom Lake College and the Los Grios Community College District. And I know we will continue to keep the focus on serving 
the students in our region as we have for more than a generation. So thank you for your time today. And I want to ask President Yamamura to step forward for a second. Whitney, this is the last chance that I have to publicly express my appreciation for you as serving uh, at your tremendous service at Folsom Lake College in the last six years. It's been difficult times, and I have already made the transition to start calling Whitney Chancellor Yamamura. So congratulations on that wonderful press opportunity for you. Best wishes in the next phase of your life. And I also want to, again, express appreciation for Dr. Rosenthal, who really is doing all of us a favor to uh, pause her retirement and come back during this transition before we begin the process of uh, the search and selection of the big shoes to fill for President Yamamura. So we'll have more conversations in the coming days about the leadership transition at Folsom Lake. But rarely do we have an opportunity to thank a uh, long-serving previous president and an outgoing president at the same time. So let's show our appreciation to Whitney and Rachel. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Good to meet you. Thanks, Chancellor King. Uh, and it's not easy to be vulnerable and share a personal story uh, that had such a deep impact on you and your life. So again, let's show our appreciation for our chancellor. So again, as uh, Chancellor King pointed out, this is my last convocation uh, at Folsom Lake College, and so uh, it's both happy occasion and, and a bittersweet one as well. Uh, many of you know I will uh, become the Chancellor of the Coast College District in Orange County starting September 1. And so I have to tell you, it's always been such an honor and a privilege uh, to have served as your president over the last five years. Uh, and I feel very fortunate that wherever I go into the community, uh, wherever I go in terms of a convention or a conference, that I get to brag about all the wonderful things that you've done. And it has truly been uh, my privilege to do so. And so uh, as I was thinking back, I, I did want to get a chance to review uh, uh, with you all the things that we've done together because uh, it has taken all of us together. And I think with COVID and everything else going on, it was, it, it, it's, it's a good time to, to kind of take a look to see where we are so that, in fact, we can use that as a launching pad uh, for the future. And so over the last five years, uh, we've had a, a bunch of projects and initiatives uh, that we've uh, uh, supported for our students. And so with that, here's some of our highlights. So number one, uh, we were not one of the 15 original colleges of the 115 statewide for the Guided Pathways pilot, but we quickly caught up with our sister colleges and we launched, thanks to the faculty and the administration and the staff, we launched our meta majors at the same semester that both ARC and CRC did as as pilot colleges. So that was quite an achievement. So give yourselves a round of applause for that. Uh, part of meta majors uh, goes from the instruction side to the student service side. And so again, uh, through uh, our vice president of student services, Melanie Dixon, Chris Thomas, Sonia Ortiz Mercado, and now Kelly <laughs> Butler. We've been able to, to provide those wraparound services and support and begin to launch them uh, in support, of, again, of our students. So from the time that we first see them through their journey, they're going to have support uh, with coaches, success coaches, uh, because of the initiatives that we've had, uh, Starfish as an example for early alert so that we can let students know if they're a little bit off track so we can engage them in conversation and help nudge them along the path. So after that, uh, we had the law intervene. So AB 705 uh, uh, was implemented so that we could increase the number of students going directly to transfer level English and math. 
and we've made some major and significant progress on that. And so first we're going to show you English. And so again, I know it, it, it might be a busy graph, but the point is to look at the bars and how big they got and look at the graphs. So, so the number of, of students that uh, we have at this college that successfully completed, not only enrolled, but completed transfer level uh, English made a dramatic jump. And that means that their time here is shorter so they can go on and transfer or go on in, to their career jobs much more quickly. And, and not only did that happen across the average for our students, but it happened for each of the major demographic groups of students. And that's what you see there on the bottom. The same story applies to math. And so again, you can see a dramatic improvement in terms of the number of students who took and completed successfully transfer level math. Those are those last two bars there. And again, it wasn't just the average student at Folsom Lake College. Every single demographic group improved over that period of time. So let's thank our math and English faculty. <laughs> So in addition, uh, we've been able to expand our equity center. I don't know if you've peeked around uh, in the Welcome Center, but this is an actual picture of the Welcome Center and how big it's going to be and how wonderful it's going to be. And again, it's thanks to the ideas at Folsom Lake College where we looked at intersectionality. Uh, one of our staffers who have since moved on uh, to a promotional opportunity said, you know what, I am a woman. I am Chinese American. And I am part of the LGBTQ community. And when I went to college, I had to figure out where I was going to go for help and support. But I'm all three of those things all the time. I want to go to a place that acknowledges my humanity and recognize that I'm all three of those things all the time. And so we have our equity center. And by expanding it, we, we want to make sure that all students feel supported and welcome. You know, I, I can't help but uh, uh, speak of my economic background, you know. We, you guys have indulged me over this uh, period of time. So, so my brain says we need something that's scalable so that it can work for all students, and we need it sustainable so that we don't have to rely on special funding, because we know funding comes and goes and grants come and go. And so with that, uh, we launched our Peer Engagement for Achievement, Culture, and Connection and excellence. So that's our P squared program. And that was named by our students, by the way. And so our initiation uh, after um, uh, the murder of George Floyd was to focus on our black African-American students uh, as the first group uh, to have peace. And so again, we launched that and hopefully we'll expand it to other groups as well. Uh, for in the last five years, we, were, we got our first federal grant, a Title III grant, which allowed for our learning skills and tutoring programs to expand. And again, we focused on math. So again, thanks to all the hard work for the math facts, the tutoring center, uh, and, and our dean, uh, we now have more than 2,500 appointments and 80 embedded tutors at Folsom Lake College. So give them a Uh, during the last five years, uh, FLC was designated an Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution. So that's Anna Peasy. The, the short version is we're an Asian serving institution. So the threshold is 5% and the year I got here it was 10, uh, sorry the threshold is 10%. The year I got here it was 10.01. So we had crossed into the threshold. We were eligible for Anapizi grants. And so we partnered with our four other colleges in Los Rios, with Sierra Delta, and being led by Sac State, we got a $2 million grant for our Asian, servings, uh, for our Asian students. Next. Uh, you should also know, again, we are working very hard to close the equity gaps. We were acknowledged by the Campaign for College Opportunity in 2021 as an equity champion because there was no percentage difference 
in our Latinx students, our Latino students, in earning ADTs than the general college population. No gap. This last year, we were also recognized by the uh, Campaign for College Opportunity, and this time uh, for 2022, uh, for excelling in equitable course placement for our black English uh, enrollment in college transfer level courses. So what that meant was 100%, every single one of our black African American students enrolled directly into transfer level English courses. And, and I hope the chancellor will indulge me. We were the only college in the district to earn uh, an, an acknowledgement from the Campaign for College Opportunity. And so, yeah, he. <laughs> so uh, when I came, my predecessor uh, negotiated uh, the Rancho Cordova of Promise, again, with a lot of hard work from a lot of people involved at the college and with the city of Rancho Cordova. So the Promise program was launched in the fall of 2017. And so it was the first Promise program and the only Promise program in the region uh, to be a first dollar. So in other words, when students get the award, even if they have a fee waiver, they can, can, they can use those um, award uh, for textbooks or whatever other needs that they may have in order to remain in college. So since then, we expanded the fund to include student textbooks. We included a second year, fee free, and now all veterans of the armed services that live in the city of Rancho Cordova also qualify for the Promise program. So we got to uh, institute, in the last five years, instit institutionalize the prison reentry education program. Uh, and so we are now serving in five correctional facilities and also formerly incarcerated students upon their return. The, the PrEP program just recently received uh, state funds, $1.5 million of an augmentation because of the good work that's been done, again, by faculty, staff, and administration. Cheers. Yeah, that's worthy. And I'll let you in on a secret, so don't tell anybody beyond our little group here. Uh, we have asked, again, thanks to the work of faculty, staff, and administration, and also at the district level, lobbying for um, Congress Member Barra to include funds for this program. Uh, and we have passed the House, and we, if we pass the Senate, that'll be another $950,000 for this program. So a lot of good things happened, including some things uh, that just makes our life easier. Uh, as an example, the redesigned website, uh, FLC was the pilot college for a coordinated approach to web services across the district. Uh, as you can see, it much more streamlined and simple and serves the needs of our students. Uh, and it has a wide array of features to optimize that student and potential student experience. So good for our folks. Uh, and then, of course, we, we, uh, the board has asked us to be a full-service comprehensive college. That means we provide the whole range of services uh, for our students in our region. And so we need more career education programs to be a well-rounded comprehensive college. And so uh, we started, well, a list over the five years. This is not in chronological order. One is manufacturing and industrial technology. We can see there. A certified nursing assistant program. The CNA program was launched during COVID. Imagine getting a program up and running during COVID. But our, our partners in the healthcare industry needed more CNAs, and we were there for them. Uh, we also have established a business analyst degree. And a utility line clearance arborist training program. And so, 
So we have fires in our backyard, you know, poor EDC gets smoke notifications and occasionally threats. Uh, and and uh, fortunately, we haven't faced the disasters of some of our sister colleges. But what's central to that, the, the loss of power and the smoke and the fires has been utility lines uh, that were, where the vegetation catches fire. Just yesterday, we finished our third cohort getting a certificate. 12 students uh, spent 200 hours, five weeks, five solid weeks in this program, and they're gonna start at $45,000 a year with a, with a promotional path to 85,000. And the side benefit is we get trees trimmed in EDC. Uh, Intel is, is one of their major sites, it's just down the street from us, and so we are one of the only 18 colleges in the nation with an artificial intelligence workforce program. And so for those of you who know me well, you know viticulture is near and dear to my heart. And, well, okay, I'm a wino. Uh, so, so, gosh, uh, Santa Rosa Junior College, Napa College, have a viticulture program. We are the gateway to Foothill Wine Country. We should have a viticulture program, too. So, again, thanks to the hard work of faculty and work with industry, we now have a very active viticulture program. And despite issues with enrollment, the wine tasting class is full with a full wait list. <laughs> Again, thanks to work and partnering with the community, uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards, is, which is the leading producer of Pinot Noir in Oregon, but we all know that, right? Uh, and so uh, they will donate 3% of their Natoma wine label sales on an annual basis to help FLC develop our program uh, in viticulture and enology, and also donate on top of that $2,000 each year to fund an annual scholarship for a student in the program. Wow. So I can honestly tell you, drink lots of wine because you're helping our students. <laughs> in addition to that, they will also, we are in negotiations to create an internship program uh, with Willamette Valley Vineyards in Oregon starting in 2023. So uh, one of the wonderful places that we have, again, just, just a special place because we have special faculty, is the Innovation Center. Uh, and as, you, as we all know, it gets jammed full. Uh, and there's a pre-COVID picture, I think. And hopefully we'll be back to that again. And we do want to make this place shine. And, and so hopefully we'll, we'll have expanded uh, space in the near future for the Innovation Center. So after the murder of, of uh, George Floyd, uh, the chancellor led us in, in a book read. And so we read, read Dr. Kendi's How to Be Anti-Racist at the chancellor's executive staff level. And from there, I, I shared that with the VPs uh, at the time. And we said, well, gosh, we should do the same thing. So we started, as many of you know, a book read with Dr. Kendi's book. And, and it proved very popular. And so every semester since then, we've had a book read, the FLC Equity Book Circle. And in the fall of 2021, we opened it up to our sister colleges, because we're so generous and kind, right? <laughs> and so uh, this semester's pick, uh, so, so in 2024, uh, uh, that's the book that you saw that we, we shared uh, and, and opened up to uh, the entire district. Uh, and so then this fall's pick, some of you may already know, and this might be news to some of others of you, is the four pivots, Reimagining Justice, Reimagining Ourselves by Sean A. Ginwright. So watch your inbox for more information. So after uh, many years where the state baseball championship was held in Fresno, I guess because maybe it was halfway in between, uh, in terms of north-south, uh, we were asked or invited or solicited in, in terms of, of hosting the final four tournament uh, for baseball. 
And so, and guess what? We were also one of the final four participants and we ended up second in the state in baseball. It also shows our community partnership. Uh, uh, some of you may know uh, Joe Gilliardi is the executive director of the chamber, and so one of his mottos is to put heads in beds to help the hotels in the area. And so uh, there were over 400 room uses uh, over this period, and it was also streamed by over 24,000 people. So they're set to return next year. And I commit to you that if Orange Coast, one of the colleges in the Coast District, makes the final four, I'll come back. <laughs> I won't tell you who I'll be rooting for. Uh, and so we, over this last five years, uh, we uh, updated our facilities master plan in anticipation of, of new construction and buildings. And dun da 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 after a long wait, uh, we. We won't blame the previous governor for holding back the state bond funds. Uh, but Governor Newsom released those state bond funds, and so with our local bond funds, that is a rendering of our science building. And thanks to, again, a lot of work by a lot of people, this is going to be the biggest, most expensive building in Los Rios. we will triple the size of the number of chem and bio labs. In addition to that, the last project uh, with our local bond money is phase two of Rancho Cordova. So that is the building on the, your right. So we hope to do groundbreaking in the fall. Uh, so sorry, I'm gonna miss that, but you know, that's just the way it is. So those are some of the things that we have collectively done together. So I hope you're proud of the accomplishments and the work that you've done that lays the foundation for the future. And so here it's a time of transition. That's sort of the reality of things. And so again, I like to think of it sort of as a, not, a nautical analogy, right? The ship is going forward. We're going full steam ahead. It's just your captain's changing. Uh, so uh, there have been a lot of changes, but no matter who comes and goes, and in Rachel's case, comes back, uh, there is a sense of stability. And it takes all of us, every, you know, you can't run a ship without every member of the ship contributing, uh, making the thing go and, and, and work well. And so that's this particular case too. And so I hope that you've got a sense of uh, the grounding that we have so that you guys can carry on to the next level and accomplish more great things. Um, and so, uh, although I won't be the helm of the ship, the proverbial ship, I guess, uh, I, I just wanted to, to show you how much Falcon pride I have with all of you. And as they say, forever Falcon. And so with that, we have a change in captains. Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> so Dr. Rosenthal, with her wealth of knowledge and experience, uh, will come to the inner role to provide stability and continuity, and she will take over on the bridge. Sorry, I had to throw another joke in there. Uh, on September 1. And so then, uh, as we search for a full-time uh, uh, president, then someone else will come along. And again, there will be a national search uh, with the goal of hiring someone as the fourth president in the history of Folsom Lake College so that they will start January 1 of 2023. All stakeholders will be deeply engaged. The chancellor has always been committed to that. And so one of the first... Uh, um, uh, aspects of that, in addition to any informal uh, discussions and, and communications you may have with the chancellor, is that there will be a formal town hall meeting, mark your calendars, Tuesday, August 30th at 3 p.m. So again, Tuesday, August 30th at 3 p.m., the entire Folsom Lake College community, faculty, staff, and administration can come, and then you can discuss the character traits for the person in the question mark. 
So as I get ready to pass on the con, you know, sorry, another naval term, uh, uh, as, because it's important, you know, this continuity of analogies. So uh, Rachel, will you join me on stage? Can we please, whoa, Dr. Yamamura. <laughs> Listening to his speech in the last five years just warmed my heart to see how many outstanding services and uh, that you all have given to the community since the time that I left. And I think all of you, and especially Dr. Yamamura, have so much to be proud of. So please, one last. <laughs> to the yeah. Very. Very impressive guys. And so, um, as he said, I, I'm just Rachel, uh, Rachel Rosenthal, and I am uh, thrilled and excited to be with you for the fall semester. And honestly, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. So I appreciate it. Um, and so what I now live in, and always have in Lake of the Pines up north, but I've been following you all's progress over the last five and a half years. And as you all grappled with the absolutely unprecedented challenges of COVID, and you've changed literally the face of education in your world and theirs to benefit students. So very impressed with what you all have done. And I appreciate uh, what a challenge that must have been and continues to be. So my hat's off to all of you. So, and I also will mention how fortunate I feel to have retired before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Completely a luck. <laughs> but I've, I've thanked myself more than once that just the fates uh, were with me on that one. But so, all right. So for today, I'm going to share a few things that you will want to have on your calendar for the fall semester. And Whitney has briefed me on some of these, but I have a lot more to learn. And I'll be in contact with many of you to help bring me up to speed. So let's start with accreditation. So. I was here during the college's last reaffirmation of accreditation, and I've chaired several accreditation uh, teams. So I'm familiar with the process. It's changed a little bit in the last five years, but I do have some background in accreditation. So for here, for us at Folsom, um, if you don't know where we are in the cycle is, as a recap, last December, the college submitted its self-evaluation report uh, to the commission, which is ACCJC. Okay. Yes, Christy, it's really cool timeline here. All right, so submitted uh, the report last December, and then uh, a, what's called a peer review team was formed in the spring, and they read and reviewed the report that you all submitted. And then as a result of that report, the peer review team came up with a list, and this is new verbiage for me anyway, core inquiries. And what these are are questions that the team had um, about the college and potential areas of institutional improvement, but it also could be for commendations as well. So now the college and the district have responded to those core inquiries, and that information will be given to the peer review team in September. Okay. Next, there'll be meetings. So mark your calendars for Tuesday, October 11th through Thursday, October 13th, as members of our peer review team will be on campus uh, they may be asking for interviews, but don't worry, you will know in advance if they, if they would like to talk to you. And they'll also hold a college-wide forum. So please add that to your calendar when the date becomes available. Okay. So then the peer review team will take the uh, results and the feedback from the interviews, our responses to the core inquiries, and then take that and submit that in, uh, information to ACCJC. And the commission will vote. And we are expecting full reaffirmation of accreditation, a notice of that in late January. So, yeah. OK. So you heard uh, Dr. Yamamura talk about that one of the key parts of the community college mission, which is increasing access to education for all students. And you also heard the chancellor talk about uh, declining enrollment over the past year. So here at Folsom, enrollment is down 6% relative to this time last year. So I want to keep an eye on that for sure, as, as the chancellor alluded, that may potentially affect our funding status as the years go forward. So there's several reasons why this uh, decline might have occurred. 
Um, not only the pandemic with COVID, there's also been, uh, if you haven't heard, widespread registration fraud where, where they were using bots and they were enrolling in community college classes to illegally collect both COVID relief uh, grants and financial aid. So system-wide, they, they think there were over 65,000 fraudulent enrollments. So, so now those have now been cleaned up out of the system. So that's one potential factor in the declining enrollment. Um, during also the same period, the UCs and CSUs uh, stopped requiring SAT and ACT scores and increased their admission rate. So potentially more students were going to the four-year level. And so what we're going to do here at Folsom is going to focus on strategic enrollment management, which is a really a pretty complex process. So we want to focus not only on getting new students, but also being able to identify, recruit, enroll, retain, and graduate students in accordance with our goals but while maintaining fiscal sustainability. So it's a pretty high bar that we are setting. And it's also enrollment management, it's not just for student services, but or only to classroom faculty. And, and I'll borrow Whitney's uh, ship metaphor, you know, this will require all hands on deck, right? So how are we gonna deal with or help to mitigate a declining enrollment, okay? First, the district's marketing team has launched a multifaceted enrollment campaign and with social media, email, billboards, and radio with content in both English and Spanish. Then, as part of our retention efforts, we're continuing the Take One More campaign. So let me ask, how many people are familiar with Take One More? A few, okay, all right. So the idea behind the Take One More is we're encouraging part-time students to take one additional class if they're able to do so. And we're also encouraging prior students to come back and re-enroll and to keep on their educational path. Okay? So that's one piece to take one more. Another one is for the faculty, to the faculty, is considering adding students up to census, right? Because every student counts. If you don't have available seats, though, encourage a waitlisted student to seek out other sections of the same course that you're teaching or another course that has a similar GE uh, requirement. Okay, so think about that. And you're going to hear more from Monica Pactel, our BPI, as the semester rolls forward about Take One More. All right, diversity and equity inclusion efforts. Um, when I was here, we did institutionalize the beginnings of some equity movement, and I, my heart is overflowing listening to all the things that have happened in the last five years. And so our goal is always to have every single student succeed and reach their goals, their educational goals. And this is directly related to strategic enrollment management. So when students feel a sense of connection and belonging on their campus, they're more likely to persist semester to semester, right? Somebody knows your name, you feel valued, you want to continue in that relationship, okay? So setting a welcoming culture attracts new students as well because they've heard through their friends or family that this is a college that really cares about the students who are there. So we want every single student, faculty, staff member to feel like a vital uh, and important member of the Falcon family, right? So, Pieces of that, when I was here, we did institutionalize several diversity and equity efforts, as I said, but it's now wonderful to watch, as uh, Whitney noted, the new Equity Center. I'm looking forward to going to visit that. Fantastic work. And as he mentioned, too, the future plans for the PEACE program to expand and include our Latino, Latinx students. So, excellent. Another piece, strategic enrollment, is uh, Folsom has joined what's called the Caring Campus Program, and it's administered by the, evidence, the Institute for Evidence-Based Change. And the idea is to create a positive, supportive campus culture and, to, and again, increase the student's sense of connectedness to the college through student-centered behaviors and activities among faculty and staff. So coaches will train employees and how to increase that connectedness to the college and change how they interact with students and develop strategies so the students can really feel like they're at home here at Folsom Lake College. 
And so we're hoping by having that caring campus culture, say that really quickly three times, um, <laughs> is that we have that type, then it will increase, again, the students will stay, learn, and persist. So this summer, some of the college's classified staff members went through the Caring Campus program training, and I look forward to hearing from them how the outcomes and how that went for them. And there'll be more, in, more into this fall, you'll hear more about it as that program will expand across the college. All right, and in other uh, exciting news, uh, a delegation from Los Rios will attend the All African Diaspora Education Summit at the University of Cape Coast Ghana, West Africa in late September. Very interesting, very exciting. And CRC President uh, Dr. Ed Bush will be the summit's lead organizer. But we do have representatives and quite a few from Folsom Lake College. They are Philip Angove, Amy Brinkley, Susie Charles Bonner, Victoire Chochezi, Nino Conley, Nicole Griffin, Baba Indiaya, and Portia Nujoku. Yeah. And one more, so you get to clap again. To represent the student voice, FLC student, and very cool, he's also the Los Rios student trustee, Trajan Robinson. <laughs> nice. Okay. With that, right, I welcome Dr. Yabamura, and I will see you all in September, as the song goes. Hey. It's very special to have Rachel uh, come back and, and steady the helm of the ship. I had to get that last one out. <laughs> so uh, as you see on the screen, a uh, uh, quote, uh, hopefully uh, uh, that means something to me and, and, and hopefully to you too. So I'll just read it. Take pride in how far you've come. Have faith in how far you can go, but don't forget to enjoy the journal journey. It's been my, my you, the chancellor stumbled on that and I did too. <laughs> Don't forget to enjoy the journey. So again, it really has been my privilege uh, and honor to serve all of you and I promise I will be back, not just if Orange Coast makes the baseball playoffs, but I want to come see you and, and, and know how well you're doing and know well how, how well you're serving my, uh, all of your students. So again, thank you very much. Convocation's over. Woohoo! Go Falcons! Can we get a one, two, three, go Falcons? One, two, three. Go Falcons!